So we are actively recording. I'd like to welcome everyone to this, I'll call it a special edition of the May 2014 webinar series, Force Connect webinar series. You're looking at the webinar series uh, kind of front page. I had, uh, I'll take full credit for botching up the e-list process and I'd sent out a whole bunch of great emails announcing this for its normal date and time and none of them went out. So we had tried to run this two weeks ago and we had three people signed up until we realized that I'd done something wrong. So we've, we've uh, plugged it in here on the 4th of June. So welcome everyone. We're joined by Brett Chedzoy and I'm going to turn the uh, presentation option over to Brett. Uh, Brett's a, a colleague and a very good friend here in the Cooperative Extension System and in the world of forestry and silvopasture. And uh, Brett has been the, the kingpin or the big toe or the big kahuna or whatever you want to phrase you want to use in New York and throughout much of the Northeast for, for um, helping educate and bring awareness to the potential values that silvopasture provides to woodland owners and graziers and uh, livestock producers. and uh, we've had a series of civil pastor presentations. We had one in April, and then this is the May version. We'll have another one in, in the normal June period. But today, Brett is going to be talking about improving pastures with trees. So with that, I'm going to mute my microphone. And Brett, welcome, and the, the cyberspace is all yours. Thank you, Pete. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Back in January, we held our second Northeast Civil Pasture Conference up in Latham, New York, near Albany. We did decided to do it this time in conjunction with the Winter Green Up Conference. This was their fifth year of the Winter Green Up Conference, which has become one of the premier grazing conferences in the Northeast. We held the inaugural Civil Pasturing Conference back in November of 2011 in Watkins Glen, New York had well over 100 people attend that from, I believe, 12 states. And at the time, we didn't feel that it would become an annual event, but more as a as-needed event. Um, the presentations from that 2011 conference, by the way, are archived on Peter's Forest Connect info website on the publications page. Some, some great presentations and information there. but. We realized a couple of years later, a lot of folks were asking about, you know, could we have another conference? And um, we felt that this time we needed to make it a little shorter to make it possible for, for more folks to attend. We had about 130 people back in November, or I'm sorry, back in January, and surprisingly, um, almost all new faces. I think there were about 10 hands that went up in the audience when we asked how many people there had attended the previous conference um, in Watkins Glen. So it, it was good to see a lot of new folks interested in this topic, uh, not necessarily people that were just newly interested in it, but uh, a, diff a different conference, different location, and, and a lot of new participants. Um, Many of you are also familiar with the Civil Pasture Forum that Peter and I created a couple of years ago following that inaugural conference. That's the silvopasture.ning.com website, which currently has over 130 members. And we set that up so that uh, we could all network, those of us that are interested in civil pasturing and share our real-time experiences. Uh, I, I feel a bit embarrassed to try and really take any credit for what's happened. Uh, there's, there's, there's a further back history of how we started talking about civil pasturing, again, here in the Northeast that dates back to work that Peter and Tatiana Stanton did with the Goats in the Woods project in the early 2000s out at Cornell's Harnot Forest. And a lot of folks were interested in the results of using livestock, in this case, uh, goats, to manage vegetation and after answering those types of questions for years, you know, can I use goats to do this? Can I use cattle to do that? I decided it was time to just, uh, you know, get over my innate uh, biases as a forester and start talking about 
using livestock as a tool to manage landscapes. Um, and so I think we'll, today's talk is not focused per se on all the benefits of civil pasturing, but it's important to keep in mind that there are a lot of benefits out there um, that extend way beyond just controlling noxious vegetation with, with animals. So today we're going to focus on one aspect or one direction of civil pasture management, and that is creating civil pastures from scratch, I guess. Uh, that is to enhance open pasture areas by incorporating trees and not just a few shade trees or a windrow here and there, but rather really intentionally establishing a valuable timber crop um, to enhance the overall productivity of, of the farm or the, the ecosystem. Uh, so many of you, I think, are quite aware of what civil pasturing is, but it's always good to start with a definition. And, my simple definition for civil pasturing is simply the sustainable production of timber, forages, and livestock on the same land. And the key word there, of course, is sustainable, meaning that we're, uh, a civil pasture is going to be a dynamic system. It's not going to look the same at the beginning as it will 10 years down the road or decades down the road. Um, these, these are dynamic systems that require adaptive management. and the conditions are always going to change and thus our management, the way we manage the civil pasture is going to need to evolve and change as well. Uh, but in the, the, the thing that makes civil pasturing different than uh, woodlot, woodlot or woodland grazing of the past is that we're not just throwing animals in there to loaf around in a shaded area, get out of the heat and the biting flies, uh, you know, maybe um, till we can get around to cutting all the trees down and converting it to open pasture. We're, we're managing the system uh, so that no one resource is managed at the detriment of the others. In other words, we're not just overstocking it with livestock and letting them uh, create negative impacts that harm the timber, vice versa. We're not just having a, a kind of an unthinned woodlot or plantation that is not allowing a lot of sunlight in and therefore not providing quality grazing conditions for the livestock. In the Northeast, well, really anywhere that civil pasturing is done, and it is a very common practice throughout most of the world, uh, but is I think we're all aware it's been a rather taboo practice in the Northeast, and that dates back to our history of uh, all our little family dairy farms and livestock farms here in the northeastern landscape where the woods was kind of seen as that area that animals were allowed fairly continual and unmanaged access, again, to get out of the heat, to get out of the biting flies, uh, you know, go in and scrounge around for whatever they could get. And as, as we started to learn um, many decades ago that when that happened, uh, trees are being a long-lived and resilient organism, it might take many years for them to show the symptoms of uh, harmful impacts, but eventually you're going to see the dieback in the crowns and the uh, mineralization in the stems, and uh, sometimes the, the symptoms are more dramatic, like debarking of trees, uh, soil compaction, erosion. But many things have changed that allow us to now manage livestock in a way that can be beneficial for these these uh, forest type ecosystems or these savanna type ecosystems. So here I sh show the two different directions from which we can ap approach civil pasturing in the Northeast. We can be adding uh, trees into our pastures or we can be adding pasture into our trees or our woods. and Regardless of which direction we approach this from, the goal is this image in the middle, which shows this uh, rather balanced and synergistic and symbiotic uh, mix of forages, livestock, and, and trees growing together. This is a picture here, an aerial photo of our farm, and uh, I, I put this up to be illustrative of a typical farm in our area in upstate New York, but really I think it's 
rather typical of much of the Northeast. We have these farms that are a mix of woods and open land, uh, tillable land or pasture land. And in the case of our farm, it's a 200 acre farm that is about half woods and about half fields. Um, all of those fields are, of course, today pastures. And uh, much of the wooded area that you see in the image, this is a fairly old image, but much of those wooded areas, pretty much all the wooded areas are being developed into civil pastures. But it's a very gradual process. It's not like we go out there and three months later we have uh, a pretty um, civil pasture setting like we saw in that, that previous slide. My experience with civil pasturing started back in the early 90s. I was fortunate enough to be in the U.S. Peace Corps in Argentina. Ended up uh, meeting and marrying my wife there, and we bought our own ranch in 1994. It was kind of a wedding present to ourselves. We've been planting fast growing southern yellow pines and different hardwood species ever since. Uh, this is a picture from the ranch here, just showing our Angus cattle under uh, loblolly and slash pine overstory. Um, my work there involved working with some very innovative rancher forester types who had been doing these large afforestations for about 15 years prior to me showing up. My job was to then teach their gauchos how to be loggers. That wasn't very successful. The gauchos quickly realized that logging was hard work and it was a lot easier riding around on horseback punching cattle. But um, this this work continues at a fairly significant scale today, and it's it's um, um, widely promoted by the provincial and federal governments and, and supported by these rural communities because they realize that not only does it help them address a number of their environmental issues such as flash flooding and uh, degraded rangelands, but it's also been a very important so source of rural employment. These these were cattle ranches that traditionally supported about one gaucho family, that's the Argentine cowboy, per several thousand acres. And when they started growing seedlings and nurseries and planting the trees and building the fences to manage the livestock better, to um, protect these young plantations and um, doing fire control and then pruning and obviously then eventually the harvesting and milling of the lumber, this forest resource gave them about a tenfold increase in rural employment, which was very significant and at the same time was a win-win for the environment, the livestock, and the ranchers. This picture here, even though you can see kind of the bunch grasses in the foreground, which would suggest a more arid climate, this is a uh, area where they receive about 40 inches of rainfall a year, the same as even more actually a little bit than in upstate New York, and yet um, much of it comes in the form of strong thunderstorms spread from spring, summer, and fall, and a lot of it just hits the ground and runs right off because of the coarse degraded soils and uh, the lack of vegetation there to, to hold it. But these trees now not only create a, a more favorable microclimate for those ruminant animals grazing in the understory, but they intercept a lot of the rainfall and hold it, break down the kinetic energy, um, allow more of it to infiltrate into the soil and add a lot of organic matter. You can see a little bit there under the cattle's feet and all the pine needle accumulations. And this is a plantation that's only about 12 years old, and, and yet you can see it's already uh, attributing quite a bit of organic matter to the soil. And um, so it was the early 90s that my experiences with civil pasturing started there in Argentina, and in the late 90s, we, well, mid 90s, we lived back in the United States, and then 1998, Maria and I moved back to Argentina again. Uh, worked up in a different part of the country, but it gave us more time to uh, develop our, our ranch there. And in 2002, we finally moved back with our three young kids to the family farm in upstate New York near Watkins Glen. And I started taking a, a more of a 
candid look at some of the issues that I've been observing for years but really never had the time or courage to do something about. And one of the, the big issues, of course, besides just the viability of our family farm was the prevalence of invasive species. Uh, many of these species like European buckthorn and honeysuckle and oriental bittersweet and barberry and privet and uh, you name it, it grows very well on our farm, had been there for, for years. And what I finally came to the realization was that uh, I had to do something about or these problems were going to persist long term and really begin to interfere with our uh, kind of our long term vision and ownership objectives for the farm. So uh, in the late 80s, when I was in forestry school at uh, Cornell and ESF, we, we planted a lot of the more marginal parts of the farm to mix conifers and uh, primarily black locust plantations. Um, this is this picture here is a black locust and black walnut plantation, and there's still some very nice walnut in there. But being a young college student, I thought I knew it all. Nobody could tell me the right way to plant trees, so we just stuck them in uh, Timothy hay fields and with really no site prep. And we all know, I think, listening in today, what happens when you plant hardwood trees in a dense sod and don't don't take care of them after the fact. So the, the locust being a bit more of a hardy pioneer species grew, the walnut kind of hung in there and suffered. This was also the same year that there was a big gypsy moth outbreak in our area. So um, it's, it's amazing how resilient trees are. But um, one lesson I learned many years ago from my numerous mistakes finally was that if you're going to plant trees you, you need to do it right or you're probably just throwing money down the drain but um this 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 particular five acre walnut and black locust plantation here on our farm today this it's about 25 years old in this picture here this was an area that was almost head high honeysuckle but honeysuckle and multiflora rows and other noxious invasive shrubs that were thriving under this light canopy of the black locust and uh, it's been grazed now for about six years and you can see that primarily through we did a little bit of spraying initially but the spraying I found was pretty ineffective it was really kind of the intensive rotational grazing that brought this area back and transitioned it back to a nice grass understory uh, you can see the cows in there in a looks like a late June time of the year with the seed heads on and they're they're thankful for that cooler shaded grazing in the in the midst of summer. So this is another picture actually right across the road from that previous plantation and I think it's important here to just cover quickly what I see as some of the major benefits of why we would want to go to the time and expense of creating civil pastures through establishing trees in open grazing areas. And, and I think this speed or this the slide says a lot right here. You can see that the, the cows are out there in the middle of summer, not particularly happy, not, not any shade. Uh, we find that our cattle any day that's over 70 degrees, they're trying to crowd under any little shrub or um, along the edge of the woods or any any place that they can they're they're not comfortable um, in in the summertime and yet much of our grazing season we frequently have temperatures that exceed the comfort level of of these ruminant animals particularly our our cattle um, that we raise which are black angus so one of the obvious benefits of soil pastures is just you know, making animals more comfortable and, and more comfortable animals are happier animals that are healthier animals and ones that generally perform better, stay healthier and improve our bottom line. But you can see kind of two two opposite extremes here, middle of winter, middle of summer. And uh, the upper picture is more of a wooded area where we thinned out all the heavy buckthorn understory, left the remaining good trees, 
transitioned it back to grass, and, the, and there the cattle are enjoying that on a hot summer day. The lower picture is a mixed conifer plantation, one of the many that we've established on our farm over the years. And this, this particular plantation we've managed more as uh, what I would call a living barn. It's just a shelter area for, for cattle. There is some forage production there, but that's not the main emphasis. We have several of these plantations ranging from one to several acres in size. And we outwinter our cattle. They're grazing round bales from late December till mid to late April every year. Uh, in other words, once the stockpile grass is, is used up in October, November, and early December, they come off pasture for a couple weeks. We do the weaning. Then the animals are thrown back together. And they spend the rest of the winter moving around. Instead of shifting them every day, they're shifting every two days. Uh, we have total, we're grazing 300 acres. It's divided into 75 permanent paddocks. So summertime, it's about a 10-week rest period from the time that they're grazing on any given acre until the time that they come back to that paddock or that acre. In the winter time, I'm, I'm lazy and uh, I only want to walk out there in the snow and cold every two days. So we put a two-day supply of round bales in each paddock and go out there and move them over every couple of days. But we, I mean, one of the keys to keeping cattle out or, or any livestock, but cattle obviously are more tolerant of extreme weather than, say, goats, is that you need to watch the 10-day forecast. And uh, when you see that the big storm is coming in or like this past winter, all the polar vortexes with extreme wind chills, it's you, you start moving this uh, this this big juggernaut of animals towards a, a living barn area like that one, the lower picture there, and, and they can ride out pretty pretty extreme cold and uh, pretty pretty bad storms, no problem in those shelter areas. In fact, I really think our cows are happier and stay healthier uh, being out like that, and than they would be in a muddy barn area where they're still going to suffer from the cold and they're going to be lying around mud and manure most of the winter. So I think we all understand very well the ecosystem services that, that trees provide, um, everything from helping protect watersheds and producing clean air to uh, aesthetic benefits. Um, there's a little quote there at the bottom that you can find a lot of information that supports these ecosystem services. This is just one that kind of caught my attention, at saying that our nation's forests, they're estimating are worth at least $400 billion in terms of storm water management alone. And, uh, you know, the way that those trees do that is, is, is um, multiple. But this, this picture here is a bit of an exaggeration, but we we see that what was a forested landscape that was cleared, probably cleared for grazing. Now you're seeing the gully and rill erosion there. Uh, Soil pastures allow us to have the best of both worlds. We can we can be using the land more intensively for agricultural outputs, but but still maintain our best timber and um, use use those trees or that forest canopy to protect the soil um, and uh, give us a lot of other things at the same time. Uh, back in forestry school, we were always told about the importance of edge habitats. Those are that transition zone between forest and open land or fields. Uh, soil pastures can be thought of in a sense as extensive edge habitat um, where, and now, now I understand that uh, putting trees into grasslands may be detrimental to some grassland obligate species. Likewise, opening deep forest to allow sunlight in and grow forages might be detrimental to some deep forest species or deep forest obligates. But we don't have a lot of this savanna-like habitat on the northeastern landscape today. So I think that we're really talking about um, creating uh, a, a, a rather unique and rather valuable 
habitat type that can be beneficial to a, a, a broad number of species. And I guess I should also point out here, I'm not saying that we should turn 100% of our almost 19 million acres of forest land in New York into civil pastures. But if you look at the just 14 million acres of private woodlands alone, plus several million acres of past, or, or, uh, pasture lands and what, what are termed underutilized grasslands in New York State, um, in the six years or so that we've been talking about civil pasturing, we've looked far and wide and found very, very few examples of intentional and, and well-managed civil pastures out there. So we have probably several million acres of these pasture lands that could be enhanced through conversion to civil pastures, plus probably about an equal acreage of farm farm woodlots that are in proximity to grazing operations that could also be uh, enhanced or perhaps better utilized through civil pasture conversion. And today in all of upstate New York, I'd guess that there's maybe a few hundred acres of civil pasture out there. So we do have an opportunity there to go from a few hundred acres to you know tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of acres of of these productive civil pasture systems and and I think that it's going to be a a a winning situation for a lot of wildlife species uh this this is kind of stating the obvious but when we now establish a valuable timber crop in our uh open pasture land we're diversifying our our uh our productive base and in our income opportunities. The same could be said of taking a plantation or even a farm woodlot and properly managing as a civil pasture and now adding this annual income stream through through the, the, the grazing revenues or the, the livestock revenues to something that otherwise would be perhaps only generating revenue every 10, 15 years when there's when there's a opportunity to harvest timber crops. Uh, this is uh, another locust and walnut plantation on the farm. This this picture was taken some years ago, but this this particular plantation has been thin three times now in the past eight years and has generated about 300 of these locust fence posts per acre. So if we use a conservative wholesale value of about five dollars a fence post, it's about half of what you would buy a treated southern yellow pine fence post for in our area today, even even in large quantities, that's that's about fifteen hundred dollars an acre of uh fence posts that we've harvested from this plantation um, that's now about twenty five years old. <laughs> I talked about this a little bit earlier, but um, in the middle of summer, our, our pastures here in the Northeast are predominantly cool season grasses. They grow well in the spring. They grow well early in the fall. In the summer, they're usually brown and dormant and not providing very high quality grazing. Civil pastures, on the other hand, uh, we we tend to have a more diverse mix of plant species there, uh, greater species diversity and richness, and finding a lot of uh, broadleaf quote-unquote weeds, which are often quite nutritious for livestock, as well as uh, sources of browse. You can see some locust sprouts there in the uh, foreground in front of that cow and just a little bit of everything, but it's really just a green smorgasbord. Uh, you can see it's nice lush vegetation that's really right up to the cow's back and they're in there on a um, hot July day. Uh, these pictures were taken just a couple days apart by the way and the cows went from a hot dry dusty kind of miserable open pasture to the civil pasture areas where the ground temperatures were 10 to 15 degrees cooler at the, at the um, same time of the day. So uh, allows them to graze longer, to perform better, and there's there's been quite a bit of research done to support um, the 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 increased performance of grazing animals when they're allowed access to to shade. But 
even better is shade that has food so they can ten, can continue grazing. The other thing that these kind of diverse smorgasbords that we would find in a civil pasture provide animals is just a greater range of plant compounds, um, particularly beneficial plant compounds when livestock are grazing in open pastures with a fairly simplistic mix of species. And our, our pastures on our farm are dominated by orchard grass, for example. Now we're adding in uh, sources of woody browse and other broadleaf herbaceous plants. And it's interesting that every time we turn the cows into a new paddock, particularly when they come off a paddock that doesn't have a lot of woody plants in it, the first thing that they'll do is walk over to the trees or to the shrubs and nibble on them for a few minutes. And Grazing animals have strong sensory feedback mechanisms, and they're, it's, it's much like when we sit down for Thanksgiving dinner and we gorge ourselves on turkey and mashed potatoes. After we stuff ourselves with protein, we start craving lemon meringue pie, um, and that's because our brains are telling us, hey, you ate too much protein, you need some energy to go with that. Uh, Cattle, you know, they do this for a living. They're out there eating plants all day long, and they're able to sense kind of what they need. They don't necessarily say, oh, I think I need to go eat a little bit of alfalfa or clover now, but they're sensing that there's something in these other plants, particularly these woody plants, that's going to help them meet micronutrient needs or uh, somehow balance the nutrition that's reaching their rumen and, and perform better or, or rather to um, better meet their, their own nutritional needs. And so the more diversity that we can offer in these animals' diets, uh, particularly through these, these kind of diverse civil pasture mixes, the, the better the trees or the better the livestock is, is likely to perform. And uh, it's not just that trees and shrubs and civil pastures provide sources of browse, uh, that's to say the, the the leaves and the succulent stems that animals can actually bite off and digest. Uh, trees can also be an important source of hard and soft mass. This is a slide I threw up. I borrowed this from one of our presenters from the Center for Agroforestry at the University of Missouri. They, they used this in their presentation a couple of years ago at our inaugural civil pasture conference, but it just shows some, some dated research of the benefit of uh, a mass producing, a soft mass producing tree like honey locust and, I'm sorry, hard mass producing tree like honey locust and the, the value that those pods, just, you know, 48 trees per acre, but 60 pounds of pods per tree. And that ends up having the feed value equivalent of a lot of bushels of corn or oats. And, and it's it's nutritious for the animals too. And and then the, the best part of all is that they can continue to produce a lot of uh, pounds of dry matter of, of forage production underneath the canopy of these trees, not to mention the, the timber value of the trees. So, um, so I hope that those slides help to illustrate some of the reasons that we're, we're excited about civil pasturing. We'll continue to promote it here. And kind of the uh, path of least resistance to date has been taking uh, rather degraded um, farm woodlot areas and plantations that are just kind of sitting there in the landscape, not really being managed or doing anything for anyone and converting those into civil pastures. But we also have this opportunity to be enhancing our pasture land through the establishment of trees and um, managing them intentionally as civil pastures. So uh, regardless though of why we decide to do this, and, and we always need to start by doing the paper and pencil exercise and seeing does it really make financial sense? In other words, if I really attribute a value or benefit to all the good things that will come out of this plus all the costs that I need to invest to make this happen, is there a, is there a net benefit 
to it. Uh, first, um, so I want to go through some some kind of what I feel are very important considerations to help us with this thought process. The first is that we need to choose trees that will contribute value. And as a forester for Cornell Cooperative Extension, I quite frequently, especially in the spring, um, usually well after the planting date, get phone calls from people that are interested in planting the old field out behind their house, or they have some land, they're tired of brush hogging it to keep down the multiflora rows. They want to know, you know, what can I plant on there? And of course they read that black walnut is worth a lot of money or black cherry or some other tree. And that's of course what they want to plant. And um, it's usually more than a, short conversation to kind of get people oriented back towards, okay, really, what what are your goals here and what what kind of tree is going to help you meet those goals? So uh, I think we have a lot of fine examples on our upstate New York landscape of trees that were planted once upon a time, uh, white spruce and um, Austrian and red pine and, and just a whole bunch of other species that, you know, there might have been a game plan for those trees back when they were planted decades ago, but today they're just kind of sitting there dying and stagnant and um, usually more of a headache than a asset to the landowner. This is a example here of what I would consider to be one of those low value plantations. This is a white spruce plantation that's probably about 40 years old now. And you can see it's, you know, the, the value of that timber is very, very low. Even if we were in upper Maine with strong pulpwood markets and the type of mechanized logging crews that would be necessary to harvest that, there's just not much value per acre there. And, uh, Likewise, there's not a lot of wildlife habitat value there. Aesthetically, it's not that attractive. So um, I, I just use this as a tale of caution that when we're picking trees that we're going to plant, um, particularly for soil pasturing objectives, we need to pick trees that we uh, that, that are going to provide us the type of benefits that we're looking for. The, the next key consideration here is to choose species that are going to do well on the given site that we plan to plant them on. Um, in, in forestry, we talk about site quality a lot, and, and site quality is uh, a term that reflects a number of factors, such as the fertility of the soil, the soil type. Soil type can be indicative of uh, soil drainage, for example, soil porosity. Um, we can go right online today and with a street address, we can pull up a soil map. We don't have to look for the old uh, printed soil maps. Of course, we can also go to our local soil and water conservation district usually and they'll do a nice soil map overlay of our, of our farm. Uh, drainage is a, is a key factor that determines site quality. Um, most trees do better on better drain sites, better drain soils, and there's there's a difference between drainage and rooting depth. Uh, many of our upland soils here in New York have uh, either an old plow pan because they were once upon a time farm fields or a natural fragile pan, but these are impermeable layers that tree roots have a hard time penetrating, creates shallow root systems and that leads sometimes to lower vigor, slower growth, and greater susceptibility to wind throw and, and just other problems. And in site quality, of course, is also affected by things like the micro topography. And the um, picture that I threw up here is, oh, well, this is from our farm. This is on a fairly low, somewhat poorly drained site. And if you look closely, you see all those dark brown things, that's nut sedge. And, and sedge would be a, 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 a indicator plant usually of a, of, of a 
more seasonally wet, lower uh, lower drainage type site. So site quality is something that we can often just assess with a trained eye. And in the and the point is that, that I'm trying to make here is that if my objective is to go out and plant, say, oak or black locusts or uh, you know, pick pick your tree and on a site like this, it's most of those species that I just mentioned are are not going to do well on a site that's growing good nut sedge. Um, there are a handful of species that will tolerate and grow acceptably well on a site like this, but but many will not. So I need to make sure that I know what the quality of my site is, and I need to know what some of these critical limiting factors are, like drainage, before I pick a pick a species or a group of species to to invest my money in. I'm going to pause here for just one second and take a quick sip of water. Okay, another very important consideration that I feel is often overlooked is to choose the best trees possible from a genetic standpoint. And uh, I think that many of us just kind of get the spring seedling sale from the local nursery or the soil and water seedling drive in the spring or you know we get a glossy catalog in the mail or and we just um, take it on faith that whatever they're offer, offering is selected from superior parent trees. Um, unfortunately many of the tree species that we have available here in the Northeast are uh, relatively little of that seed originates from what foresters would consider plus trees or genetically superior trees or seed orchards. Uh, if we were in the southeastern or southeastern United States or many parts of the western United States, some of their um, main commercial species like southern yellow pines or Douglas fir, much of that seed by contrast comes from seed orchards. These are uh, it's just what they're what the name implies. These are uh, a planting of genetically superior trees, um, both genotypically and phenotypically, and uh, their their purpose is there to produce seed to then propagate in forest nurseries. But um, so we need to do a little homework on this if if we're going to plant any significant scale, because as as this little saying goes here. You know, investing in better genetics is going to, it's going to pay for itself usually many times over through better growth, better form, uh, survival, and disease resistance. And that picture there is up near a friend's house in coastal Maine. It's uh, jack pine, like old growth jack pine growing on granite bedrock. Uh, we could plant a really um, genetically superior tree there and um, it's it's just too poor of a site. Um, you know, we're probably not going to get the return through investing in better genetics there. And, and likewise, if we have a really great site and we put those same jack pine on that really good fertile site, they're always going to probably be pretty slow growing, low value, scraggly trees. So, uh, but when we're talking about a typical civil pasture area or a typical pasture area that we want to con convert into civil pasture. These are generally decent growing sites. Um, you know, we're not generally doing uh, grazing on wetland areas or on rock outcroppings or um, high and dry oak ridge tops. You know, we're talking about land that maybe wasn't great corn land, which is why it's now pasture land, but it's, it's certainly good enough to grow a variety of timber. So uh, a tree is not a tree is not a tree within any given species. And I'll use black locusts as one example from our own farm. There's black locusts that, um, such as the shipmass variety that can be 
uh, straight as like candlesticks. It's, it, can, it can be a very, very um, nice straight tree, or it can be a very uh, crooked, gnarly little tree that looks something like an overgrown bonsai tree. And which of those two, though, is going to give us more benefit, especially if we're growing it primarily for saw timber and fence post. The, the straighter, faster growing locust is going to be the better choice. Uh, pests have become a big issue in the Northeast, and I suspect everywhere else that trees grow in the country and, and elsewhere. And notice that I um, put manual pests, because every tree species is going to have pests. But what we're really trying to avoid are choosing species that set us up for failure. And some examples here, all from our own farm, we have rhabdocline needle cast on our dug fir, we have uh, locust borer, we have scleroderis canker on the Austrian pine, we have uh, metria canker coming in on our black walnut. Now, uh, these these three here to the left, I'm not so sure that I would consider those manageable pests. Uh, locust borer, if you're going to grow blank locusts, you're going to have locust borer. But there's a number of things that we can do, and I, I don't have time to get into them right now, that can reduce the incidence of the locust borer damage. And, and it's generally a pest that affects more of the, the weaker stems, the, the more suppressed stems. So it, it can, in some ways, be beneficial to help us thin out, especially after clear cutting a locust stand and you have really dense um, suckering and, and compass growth to, to help thin it out a little bit. And because of these pests, I, I think that that's a compelling reason that we would want to not put all our eggs in one basket in terms of choosing a single species or two. That when we planted all of these trees back 20 years ago or more, uh, we never foresaw that these, you know, the ramp decline showed up on our farm five years ago about the same time as the scleroderis. The nectaria canker's been there a little bit longer. That's the same nectaria canker that attacks the butternut trees and has pretty much wiped them out on the northeastern landscape. Uh, locust borer is a native insect that's been around. but. Um, there's, we, we don't know what the next big pest issue is that's going to be coming down the pike. So we need to not only plant a variety of species for um, the purpose of hedging our bets, but also, uh, you know, as the saying goes, nature hates uh, monoculture. And, and many of these pest issues are um, agitated by having blocks of a single species to, that allows these pests to really get in there and take over quickly. This is uh, another example from our farm. This is uh, kind of a civil pasture area that had a lot of Scott's pine. Uh, fortunately, it was Scott's pine, and we have Norway spruce, and we have some white pine, and um, we even have some birch growing in there and some other hardwoods that we planted. and. But as you can see, the Scots pine is uh, dying out quite quite quickly from scleroderis canker, and will never, unfortunately, probably result into uh, to be a viable timber crop of any sort. But at least in the short term, it's giving us some some shade, and the grass grows fine under it. And then, final point I want to make about choosing species is to pick a Pick species that will do well, that is to say that they will succeed under the level of care or investment that we plan to make. Um, and I talked at the beginning about um, how when we planned our first locust and walnut plantations, uh, you know, I thought it was just about digging a hole in the ground, sticking the roots down, and the green part went up, and everything was going to be fine. And in hindsight now, I know that's not the best way to plant hardwood trees, but sometimes we can go out and care for our new, newly planted trees very intensively. Other times we cannot. And if we cannot, then we need to pick more of the hardy pioneer type species, particularly conifers or something like, say, black locusts that will 
um, at least survive, if not survive and actually start to grow under that lower level of, of site preparation and care in those early critical years. So in addition to getting these phone calls all the time about, you know, what tree should I plant? And, you know, I've been reading about walnuts, so I want to plant five acres of walnut be behind my house. I often uh, get these phone calls um, right after the person went out on a buying spree and um, decided that they were going to plant a few thousand seedlings their, their first season. And I, I just put this up as a joke, but I think you all understand that when we're starting with a situation like this, there's these old overgrown fields that we find all over the landscape. Um, but even if it's even if it's our well-managed open pastures that we want to create or turn into civil pastures, we really need to be thinking about this well in advance so that we can uh, plan properly, budget properly, and get the needed uh, site preparation done in a timely manner. And uh, creating civil pastures doesn't necessarily mean that we have to be going out there and artificially establishing the trees. If we look around, oftentimes we we have young trees already there to work with, and, and we can. This is a dense um, band of uh, maple regeneration and, and some white pine coming in, as well as a few other trees. And, you know, nature put them there for us. It didn't really cost us any money. Now we just need to go in there and figure out how to thin them out and continue to nurture them along to be, become the, the types of trees that we hope for someday in our civil pasture system. And I think that the main reason we all skimp on site prep and planning is because it, it costs money. but it's it's money well spent in my opinion and and if done correctly we're going to get more benefit out of it than than what it costs up front so tree planting is not for the faint of heart or faint of wallet as, as they say but if if we don't do certain things such as good site preparation and protecting the young trees we probably just threw our money down the drain um, and if we're going to spend all this money on things like uh, initial site preparation and putting some type of tree protective shelters around the trees, it's 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 not a one-time event. We don't go in and uh, strip spray or spot spray, plant the tree, put the tree tube around it, walk away, and come back in 20 years. Uh, ready to enjoy our forest. Um, this lower picture here is something that you see all across the landscape here of somebody that invested a lot of money to get a single tree in the ground. The seedling was probably a dollar, planting it was another dollar, the site prep was probably a dollar, and then the tree tube was probably another four or five dollars, and so on and so forth. And then um, that seedling is just never going to make it because the tree tube got knocked over in a snowstorm or a curious deer and um, it's it, 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 you threw the money away. Uh, this is another thing I often see on the landscape. Um, I'm not sure exactly what was planned in these tree tubes, but I'm pretty certain it wasn't these aggressive climbing vines that are coming up out of the top of every tube. So if we're going to go to the time and expense to do it at all. We need to be thinking about, you know, again, not that one-time planting event, but really this is going to be a multi-year commitment to get these young trees up and running before um, they, they can kind of take care of themselves. And what makes tree planting a, a, a bit unique in areas that are intended for civil pasturing is that we're now we're throwing into the mix uh, grazing animals as well. Not, not that there aren't plenty of uh, rodents and rabbits and white-tailed deer and other curious critters that are out there wanting to eat our young trees, but if we're going to continue to use these civil pasture areas or these, these, these new plantations rather concurrently with, uh, with our grazing objectives, then we need to be thinking about how do you protect these young trees from herbivores or from grazing livestock. And 
I could rattle off dozens of different ways that, that we can approach this. Um, and, and it's really going to be site specific. And in some cases, individual tree protection may be the most effective and cost effective way. In other areas, uh, excluding animals from a, a new planning for several years might be necessary. That's what we do on our ranch in Argentina, where we plant young. Um, pine seedlings and find that it's most cost effective to just keep the cattle out of there for the first couple of years and then graze it gently the following couple of years and try and keep the livestock out of there during the middle of summer when they want to rub on everything because of biting flies and we also try and keep the bulls out of there that want to rub their heads on everything. These are just little things that you learn through experience. Uh, in, in some cases, it might make sense to protect an entire row, like this, this row of hardwoods here. Um, and, but if you're looking at a situation like this, this is our farm uh, with about a 100 cows that are being grazed in small paddocks with daily rotations. When you have this type of livestock pressure, having, a, a, you know, just like some T-posts and deer netting around your trees isn't going to cut it. Um, those cattle are going to make short work of, of a flimsy tree shelter. These are um, some examples of kind of more extreme cases. This this is taken down at the Stone Barn Center in the lower Hudson. Uh, Peter's standing there in the background, but what they've done is take four T-posts, put woven wire around there and then put barbed wire so that the cattle and sheep don't come up and rub their heads and demolish the wire. And, and this has been very effective for them. Um, it's, it's small enough that deer won't jump inside of it. This is an experiment that we did on our own farm where we took kennel wire, bent some of the vertical wires outward to create sharp barbs. The tree tube keeps the rodents and the rabbits away from the young tree, and the cage keeps the cows from coming up and rubbing their heads on the tree tube and knocking it over. Uh, this this experiment here hasn't worked particularly well, and it's partly because this cage is not anchored down with heavy enough posts. But this this type of protection here might cost twenty dollars a tree. This might cost um, five dollars a tree, but even though I might have saved myself $15 between protecting this walnut and, and this, this is actually a honey locust here in this tube. Um, if my ornery little calves come and knock these cages over eventually and demolish the tree tube, then it didn't matter that I saved myself $15 initially. I lost the entire investment. So um, thus, we need to make sure that we have a sufficient level of investment to protect the trees. And I've mentioned this now s several points along the presentation, but I'm, I, um, I have to say I'm not a, I'm not a um, big practitioner of my own advice, but I think that uh, many of us plant trees because it, it just seems like the right thing to do and we feel good about it and, you know, uh, Arbor Day tells us that it's it's a wonderful thing to plant trees, but as as farmers and foresters and landowners and land managers, I think we need to be looking at the economics of every action that we take. So, foresters and forest economists use a number of different formulas to look at the uh, feasibility of forest investments. One of the more common ones is net present value, and all net present, and so you can go online and look up all of these formulas and find the automatic calculators and um, do an internet search for something like uh, forestry investment formulas, and you know look at everything from internal rate of return to net present value to cost benefit and uh, future present value. There's there's a lot of different ways that we can assess the feasibility of, of a um, proposed project, but net present value is one that allows us to take all of the uh, all of the costs and all of the revenues, both short term, mid term, long term, and discount them back to the present through some given interest rate. And 
when we add up all the costs and we add up all the revenues, if it's if if it's positive, then we assume it's a good investment. And if it's negative, then we need to take a, a closer look at you know why are we why exactly are we doing this? And those benefits can be things other than just monetary values, by the way. Um, and I went through a series of slides earlier saying some of the other kind of less tangible values or benefits that civil pastures can give us. And this is just a very quick example from our farm, that black locust plantation I showed. If I were planting it in year zero and thinning it and um, thinning it at years 15, 20, and then doing a final harvest at years 25, uh, don't get hung up on these numbers. I just put them in there as an example. But if I'm investing $1,000 an acre initially and I spend $100 the first year in maintenance and $50 the second year in maintenance, and that could be things like mowing and replanting some trees, and then I look at the, uh, the those revenues, the, the bottom figures there in red are all of those values discounted back at 5% to the present. And you can see there that there's a positive value of $1,100, which would suggest that it was cost effective for me to take my pasture, spend this money, or rather invest this money to plant a crop of black locusts on it. And I um, made money on that investment. And one of the wonderful things about locusts is that once you plant it once, you can uh, manage it through through an even age system and basically pro, um, perpetuate that plantation through the through the the aggressive suckering which is typical of black locusts. This is um, another experiment that we're doing currently on our farm of doing a direct seeding of black locusts. You can buy the seed. The seed is very inexpensive, and we strip sprayed in the fall went through with our mechanical tree planter in the spring to make a shallow furrow, just uh, drop the seed in by hand. You can see the, and, and did this, um, did the seeding like late May when it was warm and humid. Um, in other words, bad hang weather makes great direct seeding weather. You can see the young, uh, I don't know if you can see my pointer in the presentation, but you can see the young locust seedlings coming up through here. And this is a, a year later, and the, the um, these are planted offset a few feet from our single strand high tensile fences that form the, the paddock division fences, and then we set up a temporary fence on the other side. So the plan is that once these locusts are up and running for a few years, we will. Uh, uh, Pete's telling me to click on the pointer, but I think you can all see the the locust seed seedling here in the lower right hand corner. And after those locusts reach a certain size and kind of get above the browsing height of the cattle, then over time they're going to spread out on their own. And over here, uh, I'm going to mess things up here. Click on the blue pointer in the upper left hand corner. Okay. Uh, so, all right, so you can see over here some some older locusts, and some of these have been harvested for fence posts, and that's caused this uh, root suckering. And you can see how they're spreading out into the adjacent pastures. So this is a poor man, thank you, Pete, a poor man's way of planting a few trees and then getting a lot more trees further down the road. And, and this area has been grazed. These suckers are a few years old now. Um, and, and many of them uh, currently are about 8 to 10 feet high after just a few seasons. This, this area is still being grazed, but it's only being grazed a day at a time about every 10 weeks. So only maybe twice during the grazing season when these uh, locust suckers or locust sprouts even have leaves on them. And uh, because the cattle are in there, for a short period of time, it's a very intensive short duration grazing, and then there's a long rest and recovery period in between. These locusts, being a fast growing species, are able to eventually outgrow the cattle. And yeah, you know, it creates a little bit of it, it, this isn't the world's best quality locust to begin with. So you get a little bit of deformation of the stems where they've where the cows have gone through and nipped off some of the, the terminal leaders, but 
under high density, this this in time will will outgrow the, uh, or it'll there will be enough density there that it, it should form a nice stand of relatively good quality stems. So there's there's so many more details to how to properly plant trees, and I'm just assuming that many of you have quite a bit of experience of not expertise in planting trees. So I really didn't want to turn this talk today into a tree planting talk, uh, but rather how we can do tree planting to create civil pastures and, and all the reasons why we would want to think about um, planting or, or creating civil pastures from scratch. And I'll just point you to this resource that's also on the forestconnect.info site, the one that's down below here. This is a Northeastern Tree Planting Reforestation Guide that Jim and uh, Jim Okpierski and Peter and um, I forget who the third author is put together uh, about five years ago. And it's it's really a good technical document on all the things that we need to be thinking through carefully before we just, you know, get this itch to go out and, and plant trees. And, and here's the link, of course, to that civil pasture forum that um, I put up there, and, and that would be a great place for people to ask questions, you know, hey, I'm thinking about planting this tree to create a civil pasture. What do you guys think? There's there's a lot of uh, good minds on that forum, and um, also just to say, hey, I did this, and it worked or it didn't work, because we all want to learn from that experience. So I think uh, I didn't – we are done, and – um, I, I don't think we went too far over. You didn't really give me a timeline, Pete, so or a time perfect. deadline. You did so. a great job, Brett. That was perfect. Well done. Thank you. Um, so before and people, if they have questions, certainly start typing them in, but I want to call your attention to the last entry in the chat pod is an exit survey. Please just click on that link, and it will open up a web page for you. And... Um, you know, and then you can take that exit survey. So, and I want to reiterate the civilpasture.ning site. This was, you know, one that, uh, this is a Ning site, a social media site that Brett um, maintains. I provide a little bit of assistance, but it's a great place to get in and share ideas and, and ask questions. Um, you, Brett, you spent a lot of time talking about black locusts, and you and I are both big fans of black locusts. Are there other hardwoods that people might consider if they want to be, you know, certainly it depends on the soil, but are there other hardwoods that lend themselves particularly well to silo pasture types of settings? Well, if we want really multi-purpose trees, then we can be thinking about some of the nut trees or fruit producing trees. Uh, I think the sky is the limit. It's just like people ask all the time, well, can I use, can I do civil pasturing with sheep? Can I do it with goats? Can I do it with horses? Yes. Can I do it with, you know, cattle? Yes. Can I do it with dairy cattle? Yes. Uh, can I do it with pigs? Yes. Um, you know, it's like asking, okay, can I plant oak trees? Yes. But um, I think we, we talked in detail, though, about the differences between um, types of trees and more the hardy pioneer type trees that can uh, tolerate like a sod environment. And a sod environment is, is a very harsh environment for a young tree. Versus, and, and if you're going to grow uh, hardwoods today, it would be like the equivalent of establishing a vinifera grape vineyard or, uh, you know, some type of high, high production um, orchard. You just, it's going to be a very management intensive and input intensive system. So will that pay off or be better than say planting a lower input type tree like Norway spruce or black locust? Maybe, maybe not. It really comes down to what our objectives are. Okay. Um, there is a question from CJ Sloan who's been active on the Silva Pasture Ning site. Um, wants to know about a source for ship mass black locust. I put a post on the civil pasture forum a couple of weeks ago, and I don't believe anybody's replied to it asking that very question. Uh, does anybody know of a commercial source of ship mass black locust out there, or at least improved 
black locust, and I, I don't believe anybody had replied to that. A, a friend of ours, Roy Brubaker, who gave the previous webinar presentation a month ago in the series, had, had initially asked me, and I told him I would put it on the site. Um, we're hoping to change that. Um, maybe you could mention quickly, Pete, about what what we're up to right now with Locust. Sure. So, so Brett and I and Carl Albers and Martin Vandergren with the uh, uh, NRCS Plant Material Center in Corning are, as we speak, awaiting a shipment of of black locust seed from Hungary, which has. Uh, and, and people are thinking Hungary. Well, in the early 1700s, uh, Hungary had largely deforested the country. And the first tree species that they imported to try their uh, to reforest their country was black locust, which now makes up about a quarter of their forested acreage in Hungary. And then for the last since the 1960s, they've had a tree improvement program where they've been selecting for um, fast-growing, well-formed, um, high-volume, high biomass accumulation um, varieties of black locust, and we have. Um, a kilogram of black locust seed that's been sh shipped last week, and it's hopefully now at the plant inspection center down at JFK, and we'll be um, starting some seedlings. So we'll probably do a few this first year and do some outplanting trials and see how they perform and, and expand that in the next few years. So we're, we're excited about the potential of that. But, but even if you don't get your hands on any of this Hungarian stock, uh, and, and we we don't know if and when anything will be available yet. Um, there are a lot of really nice straight black locusts out there in the landscape. There's also a lot of very not nice straight locusts out there on the landscape. So uh, somebody told me once that ship mass tends to produce um, very only very scattered amounts of seed. Uh, in other words, it's not a heavy seed producer, but um, my advice is that if you know, probably the best thing is to just go look for some straight trees in your local community and be looking for pods. Um, you can find the pods almost year round, usually because the they they fall from the tree usually late fall throughout the winter, especially after heavy wind and snowstorms. But they they lay there on the ground for literal years. Okay. And there is so do when you're looking at, at the clumps of black locust, you see probably a full range of it, but you know, I'm envisioning some places where there's a clump of really ugly or I'll say poorly formed locust, and then other clumps tend to be have a higher percentage of well formed stems. Is that is that a clonal response or and, you know, Brett? I'm sorry, I didn't under, I didn't catch all that, Pete. So what what I've been looking at at clumps of black locusts when I'm driving around. There are some areas where I see that are um, particularly uh, poorly formed locust. And then there are um, other areas that have, you know, pretty nicely formed locusts. I'm assuming that that's a genetic trait and that if you went and collected seed from the areas where you had the better formed locusts that you'd get, you'd have, you'd have to hope for better formed offspring. I agree with that statement. Yes. Okay. Um, I know. Uh, by the way, somebody was asking about their continuing ed credit. Um, yeah, I just I just posted that okay. link, so people should go and see that. So uh, Peter Collin was asking about Scleroderis in Western New York. Um, what for for those of you who are out about what's what's the distribution of Scleroderis? Is that pretty prevalent this year? Brett, do you know what are you seeing? It's well, it's been here in this Finger Lakes for I would say at least five years now, and it seems to the first to go are the Austrian pine, and Scott's pine seems to be pretty heavily affected by it as well. Um, but there seems to be more variability in in the resistance among Scott's pine. You'll see some some that are completely dead, and some that are still quite healthy looking. But it, it it's also attacking many of the other two and three needle pines on our farm. Um, interestingly enough, the one that we've seen that seems to be impervious to it is ponderosa pine. We actually have some really nice ponderosa pine growing on our farm um, and not a sign of scleroderis on it yet. But it, it, we also have to keep in mind scleroderis is just one of numerous 
pests affecting pines today. And, and of course, Douglas fir has its own range of pests. Um, you know, we have uh, the the wood wasp cyrix in this area now for about seven or eight years. That's um, attacking pines. Obviously, white pine weevils always been with us. Uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a bit despairing at times to think about how many species we've kind of taken off the, the table in terms of being options for reforestation projects. But, uh, you know, does that mean we should stop planting trees? No, it just means that we need to be a little bit more attentive to what we're planting and diversifying what we're planting. All right, great. Well, if there are no other questions. There was one about black locusts okay. being an invasive, and oh, that's okay. a good one to answer because it comes up all the time. Peter and I frequently get an earful about this. Uh, locusts is, well, it, it's, a, it's more or less a native species throughout much of the Appalachian Range and even into New York. Um, New York doesn't consider it a native species, but that's open to debate in our opinion. Um, Black locust, with its uh, ability to sprout through the root system, or these root suckers, can tend to spread into areas, and, and you saw this in my slides, into areas, and, and sometimes it's into areas where we don't want it. It's into utility right-of-ways or uh, roadside edges or um, trails, uh, and, and even into sort of these critical, special unique habitats like pine barrens. And um, listing as an invasive species today, I think will help increase our awareness of how to better pick and choose where we where we plant trees, but it's not gonna make black locusts go away. Where it's already a problem, it's gonna continue to probably be a problem, just as we've seen with all the many, many other dozens of uh, plants on the bad list. And, um, you know, local problems need local solutions. Listing it statewide as an invasive species is, I, I don't see the sense in that personally because A, it's not going to make black locusts go away in areas where it's already a problem, and B, it, it just makes it more difficult for those of us that have uh, legitimate projects like, say, creating civil pastures on our farm. To, to get a hold of good material and, and, and utilize what to me is one of our most versatile species. Okay, so there are a couple of more questions here that have come up. Kimberly is asking, uh, pointing out the locust that comes up naturally in Nebraska has thorns, and if there are thoughts on, um, like thoughts on being able to select for uh, presence or absence of thorns with cattle. Um, okay, I've been I've been generically saying locusts. I'm really talking about black locusts, but there's many other locust trees or locust right. species out there. There's yes. honey locust, for example. Honey locust has the really long thorns. That's the one that looks pretty frightening when you see the um, the, the thorny variety. There's also a thornless variety, the Inermis, Gladitia triacanthos Inermis. And um, black locust thorns don't seem to, those are more like short rose thorns. They don't, they, they don't, they only really occur on the juvenile wood, in other words, the new young shoots. And our cattle, I, I see them in there all the time just rubbing them, rubbing away and you know, going in and amongst the, the trees, and I've never noticed any problems with them getting thorns. I suppose if it really affected them, they'd stay out of the locusts, but doesn't seem to doesn't seem to phase them much. So, but there's many other tree species out there that have thorns. I mean, mesquite and uh, hawthorn or thorn apples. Um, you know, uh, plenty of trees out there with thorns. It's not just locusts. I have a vague memory, this goes way back to the 80s when I was at uh, undergraduate at Purdue, they were looking at black locusts as a biomass species, and when they would coppice it, the coppice stems um, 
particularly those the, the stump sprouts had more prominent thorns than the uh, seedlings that developed from uh, planting. Yeah, so, but, I mean, you, you could imagine that that's a you know a, a trait that the that the species you know, I'll say activates um, in response to a disturbance like cutting. Yeah, the root suckers on our farm really are pretty formidable looking, but once they get like head high or so, the thorns tend to be up in the air and the main stems are, you know, pretty clean. So when we cut locust that's a few inches in diameter for fence posts, it's very rare to come in contact with any of the thorns at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter had a question there about from the time you plant trees till the time you can start grazing again, how long? And, and the answer to that is it totally depends. Um, I mean, it depends on, you know, if, you, if you're not going to use any type of tree protection, then really you just would want the trees to get to a height in, in diameter where they're going to be resistant to whatever impacts the grazing animals might might exert on those trees, and, and that really depends on how you what the livestock is and how you're grazing them. Uh, if, if you're going to flash graze them through an area with young trees, chances are their heads are going to be down the grass, focusing mostly on the grass, but leaving them in there half a day longer, they could really do some serious damage to your young trees. So that's an experience thing that you, you're just going to have to figure out from, you know, there is no hard and fast period of time. It's it's just going to depend on what you planted and how you plant it and how fast it grew and how you're going to manage the animals once you put them in there. Very good. Well, I think we will call this webinar to a close. I want to thank Brett again, and um, Brett will be live again tonight at 7 p.m. He'll be live between now and then, but he'll be live and on air at 7 p.m. <laughs> and, and I'll probably uh, say something completely different tonight. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, thank you all for participating, and thanks to Brett. And just a reminder, all of these webinars are archived on the Forest Connect YouTube channel. So if you go to youtube.com slash Forest Connect, you can see, um, I don't know, 40 or 50 or 60 of the archived webinars. So. Thank you all very much. Have a great afternoon. Thank you, Brett. Thanks. I'll see you.